Hey, you're listening to the Tales of a Gearhead podcast. This is brought to you by Cornwell Tools. I'm your host, Stacy David. And Cornwell Tools are the choice of professionals, but not just professionals. Also, for everybody that wants to do any kind of quality work with quality tools, better check out Cornwell. All right, let's get to it. All right, we're starting to get into the time of season where the weather gets cold and you have to do some maintenance on your vehicle. So I'm going to ask you a question. Those of you that are listening right now, this very second, don't look anywhere else. Do you know how to change your spare tire? Do you know how to get your spare tire out of your car, put it on? Now, don't no looking at the manual. Think about it. If you were to have a flat right now, if you have a spare, how to get the spare out, where the jack is located, and how to do it. If you don't... You need, to, you need to learn. You need to get your manual out and spend some time reading it. Those of you that have kids, you need to make sure you're spending some time with them, teaching them the basic fundamentals of a vehicle because that's some pretty serious stuff. I have two daughters and they have both had their issues with their cars, generally about tires. My one daughter has been through two rims now and not just tires in her mini cooper because she seems to be drawn to the biggest potholes that are out there and she hits them squarely in the center i gotta give her credit her aim is fantastic but <laughs> she also bends the rims i have shown up to rescue her several times with my pit crew is what i call it i have my box and i have everything and we make a game out of it see how fast the dad can come as her pit crew and change her tire but as i'm doing that she is out there watching she, i'm walking her through that so now at least when she has a problem she pulls off to the side of the road or gets into a parking lot so she's not on the highway but now unfortunately her car doesn't have a spare so that's the only reason that i'm showing up because that particular car doesn't have a spare but see the thing is folks if you don't know that you need to know that you know, if you have a like a car like a Mini Cooper or some of these others that don't carry a spare at all, you need to know that. You need to know what kind of tires you've got. You need to know what kind of pressure is in your tires. So when that light goes on that you have low pressure, you need to be able to pull in and get to air it up. Because yeah, that's easy. Hey, I'll take it to the shop, man. Those guys are popping you for 30, 40, 50 bucks. Because there's always an upcharge on something else. Hey, you know, I put air in your tires, but I noticed that this was bad. And I mean, they're always going to be able to find something and a lot of times they'll do stuff that you don't really need to change right then and there. But you don't know that unless you know your vehicle. You know, know your tires first. That's the big thing, especially in this time of getting into the winter months. The second thing is your wiper blades. Could you go out onto your car right now and change your wiper blades? Now, I know some of you guys are probably thinking, well, why would I do that? I can drive down to Pep Boys or O'Reilly or, you know, AutoZone and they'll do it for free when I buy them. And that's great. But you really should be watching on how they do it in case, you know, you get a branch hooked up in one of yours and rip it off and you need to put one on. It's kind of a nice thing to know how to do. But just, you know, is the guy's doing it? Watch him do it. That way you know how to do it. Your coolant. That's another important thing. Do you know where to put the coolant in? Do you know what kind of coolant your vehicle takes? For those of you that don't know, coolant is a, you know another name for antifreeze. You need to know what kind of coolant because not every vehicle takes the old green Prestone style antifreeze. There's different types out there, so you need to know what your vehicle takes. And then, of course, the last being your oil. You need to know where to put your oil in, how to check it, and if you have a gauge, you need to know how it should read and when it's reading funny. And if you have a light, you need to know what to do if that light comes on, what to look for and all that kind of stuff. Most of that is in your manual. And if you're a car guy or a car girl in the, in the family, make sure that you're teaching that to your kids. You know, they may kind of roll their eyes a little bit, but you can make it fun. And they'll get out there and they'll get their hands dirty and they'll love it. I promise you, my, my daughters love it because it makes them feel more independent they're less dependent on somebody you know anytime you can give knowledge to somebody that's huge and you will be surprised they might just want to come back out and help you with the big stuff you know with the motorcycles and the hot rods and see then now you got it going because you know young kids make great manual labor for sanding <laughs> I had to laugh as a kid, man, when the movie Karate Kid came out and he's like, sand the floor. You know, what a great way to get kids to do all the grunt work on your cars and your fences. I never could pull it off like Miyagi could, though, man. 
<laughs> All right, I've got a question here from Andrew. And he says, hey, Stacy, is it possible to swap an LS engine and transmission into a 2007 Cadillac SRX all-wheel drive? He says, this is my wife's daily driver, and it started making a kind of a low-end knock or possibly a piston slap noise at initial morning startup. He says she loves the car, and he says he doesn't want to tell her that it may need major repair work soon. Now, he says it only has 55,000 miles. Any suggestions? <laughs> okay, I love this letter, Andrew. This is great. You're obviously a real hot rodder. He's looking for any chance to swap an LS <laughs> into his wife's daily driver. Oh, I love it, man. That's great. Uh, my suggestions. Yeah, actually, you're not going to like this. First of all, the car only has 55,000 original miles. You got a lot of miles left in this car even if you have to repair the engine. Now, the fact that it is your wife's daily driver, I would suggest just fixing what you have. Even if the current motor is bad, I would put the money into rebuilding that engine. Now, to your question as a hot rodder, uh, yeah, you can put an LS in pretty much anything. I mean, you can put an LS in a shopping cart. But my question is, do you have the time and the money and the wherewithal to do this to your wife's daily driver. Now, if you're taking the car and making it into a hot rod and a toy and a, and a fun car, that's one thing. But if it's her daily driver and it needs to be, you know, reliable, I would stick with what's factory. And this comes from a lot of years of experience hot rodding, not only my own daily drivers, but my wife's and my daughter's and my friends and all that stuff. Because keep in mind, if you put a an LS or a Coyote or any other engine swap into this vehicle. It's not just getting the motor and transmission in there, which is enough of a job, drive shaft, all that other kind of stuff. Now you're talking about modifying the fuel system, the electrical system, the cooling system, the exhaust system, the gauges, the ECM. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So that's a, that's a big job for somebody's daily driver. And if she still wants it to be a daily driver, which is what it sounds like, I would suggest, you know, just fixing the problems in it and driving the car until you're ready to turn it into a hot rod or a project. Then do your LS and your drivetrain swap and, and then have some fun with it. All right, Andy, I hope that helps, man. Good luck to you. So a couple years ago, you came out with a really cool kids book called the the purple bicycle and uh -huh. we went to an elementary school you did some readings we yeah. sent just hundreds of them hundreds and hundreds of them out and i knew that you were talking about maybe uh, writing another book is it for little kids is it for big kids are you just starting it are you finished <laughs> yeah it's called the little hot rod and uh, i actually started this story before the purple bicycle but it's a it's a longer story so to answer your question it's for a little older age group at least that's where i see it fitting younger kids will like it too i don't really write toward an age group i just kind of write things that I think everybody could kind of get the gist of. But the idea of the little hot rod, once again, just like the purple bicycle, it kind of chronicles people. You know, cars to me are almost a look in the mirror of what people could be. It starts out and it's it's about this car and I won't give all the story away, but he's, um, you know, he's just kind of average. You know, he's, there's nothing real. He's not a Corvette and he's not a SS this or not a Hemi that. You know, he's just this average car and he goes through life and he's trying to find this thing called character because he's told that that's what makes you special. So anyway, he goes through life and he finds out, you know, life is kind of rough on him like it is on most of us. And he ends up pretty much dangling on the end of a tow truck chain until a hot rodder, surprise, gets hold of him and transforms him. And all of a sudden he becomes this very, very famous race car. At the end of the story, he ends up going back to where he's from. He's kind of embarrassed because he doesn't resemble himself at all. And he's come to realize that he has turned into something that's even greater than what he started with. To me, that kind of chronicles life. You know, a lot of us, we start out, you know, thinking one thing, you know, what you want to do after you graduate high school, 
usually things change and you roll with the punches. You know, I've got a lot of friends that have come back, you know, from deployments and stuff and they're not the same person that they once were. There's parts missing or there's things that are different or people that have gone through, you know, a divorce or something and they they carry these these scars and this kind of stuff and you can either let those scars dictate your life or you can use them to, you know, augment your life and use them you know, for what they're there for. And that's kind of what this story is about. As far as the age group, and like I said, the people I'd like to reach, it's just everybody, you know. We're, and the story is done. I finally finished it. Good night. You know, this this story was long. And, you know, you got to cut them down. You got to keep them, you know, moving. You know, somebody can follow it and read it quickly. And then, the you know, there was the decision what kind of car to make him. And, you know, and, and how I wanted to end the story. And it is written now. And it is gone to the illustrator. So as soon as he puts the drawings in, we will have this thing out. And I've got several others I'm working on too. But this will be the next one out. All right, I've got a question for you guys. What is the most important tool in your garage? All right, I know you're thinking. I know you're thinking. Come on. Give me, yeah, all right. All right, well, it's probably the one you use the most. And that would be your sockets, your ratchets, your screwdrivers, and your wrenches. And if you want quality tools there, you probably ought to check out somebody like Cornwell. Now, granted, you can get some cheaper tools. And honestly, there's a place for those, those ones that you want to bend up and heat and go into certain places and those screwdrivers you don't mind screwing up. <laughs> well, that's where you get the cheap stuff. But if you want real quality tools that are going to last and have a warranty, that's where you need to check out somebody like Cornwell. They've been doing it forever. And believe me, you do get what you pay for. The next question I've got here comes from Ty, and Ty is talking about the Sergeant Rock truck. He says, man, I love that truck. He said, could you please tell me if the tailgate art was based off of an actual military cemetery? If so, which cemetery? I'd like to visit it. Well, first of all, that is extremely flattering that you would want to do that. But actually, Ty, it was not based off of an actual cemetery photo or anything like that, but it was based off of like Arlington or actually the, um, the big cemetery in Normandy, and they're all set up the same way. And when Mickey Harris, the guy that did the artwork on that, I told him I wanted kind of an Arlington look. And if you've ever been to the, the Arlington Cemetery, you'll notice, or any military cemetery, the way that they've set the headstones, they line up vertically when you look, but they also line up diagonally uh, when you look across. It's really cool the way they're set up. It just has a real statuesque kind of feel to it. Now, a lot of people don't know how that all came about. You know, I've known Mickey for a long time, and Mickey's just a fantastic artist. Because you never really tell an artist exactly what you want. At least I don't, because I like them to take it and, and bring their art into it. So I said, here's what I want, Mickey. I want like an Arlington look, and then I want you to add the artifacts of pretty much every major skirmish that has happened in American history, from the Revolutionary War to the Alamo to the Civil War to World War I, World War II. You know, all of these, I want those in there and... Obviously, I want a cross, and I want that scripture on the, on the lead headstone. I said, but I want it to represent the past, the present, and the future of this country and our military and what they have done. And uh, that's kind of the parameters that I gave him. And then he went to town on it. Mickey knocked this thing out in just a few days, if you can believe that or not. I mean, just the guy is just a, a great talent. And he added the ghosting, and he added the, the timeline. You know, if you, if you look at the tailgate, you see the uh, past, the present, and then off to the side, the future is separated. And there's no ghosting or anything behind that. So there's so many textures to this picture. I'm not even sure Mickey himself realized what he was doing. And one of the things, I, I wanted him to really kind of show off the, the Vietnam era guys because they tend to have been overlooked since the Vietnam War. And so he put them kind of down front and center off to the side, you know, so they're kind of in the forefront, which I thought was really cool. But another thing, you know, there's a lot of artwork on Sergeant Rock. I haven't really had a chance to talk about it. All of it is very unique, is very personal 
from not only my standpoint, but from the other artists and stuff that did it. A lot of people don't realize there's a whole piece of art on the firewall of that truck as well. And you don't see it unless the hood is open. And of course, the, the motor blocks some of it. But the artist that did it, his name is Cliff Daigle, and he was a friend of mine. And it started out, you know, the firewall was all painted, and, you know, I was like, this is kind of boring. I said, Cliff, you know, it'd be really nice if you did like a, a ram, you know, because it, it's basically a Dodge, and Dodge's big thing is a ram. I said, you know, let's make Sergeant Rock a ram and, and dress him up like the old blood and guts Sergeant Rock, you know, but he's a ram with the ram horns and all that other stuff. And he said, oh, that's a really good idea. I said, let's just do the head on the firewall. So he did. And he painted this really great ram head with a helmet on, you know, to get the cigar out of the teeth and all this stuff. And it looked really creepy <laughs> because it was just a head floating in the firewall. And I was like, oh, this, it was a good idea. But I said, man, uh, we got to add more to that. It looks odd. So I said, can you just add a body or something to it? He said, I'll tell you what. He said, let me just kind of work with this a little bit. And I said, go to it, man. Go ahead. So he painted a whole night scene based off of that head. He did the whole body. And now he's, he's got the big Arnold Schwarzenegger arms, you know, with the big machine gun. And the Memphis Bell is flying over the top of him. And the guns are firing. And it's just this great night scene that he did this full mural <laughs> when he was done I'm like Cliff that's fantastic the only problem is I'm going to cover some of it because the motor's got to go in there he said ah that's okay but I have a lot of pictures of it before we put the motor in there and uh, you go on our website you can see some of the pictures but he did a really good job on it and uh, kind of created the whole Sergeant Rock character in that ram. Now, another thing, Cliff is also the guy that painted the Memphis Bell girl on the side of the truck. And that's a whole new story itself because at the time I was doing a tribute to the Memphis Bell and there is some artifacts from the actual Memphis Bell on the truck. Not only did I have, at first I had some machine guns that came from the Memphis Bell. Of course, those went back to the military. So I have replicas on there now. But some of the actual rivets that were pulled off the bell when it was being restored, I have, you know, on the truck there. But anyway, so I said, I want to tie this in with the Memphis Bell as well. So I said, I want the Memphis Bell nose art on each side of the truck. And she needs to be in a red outfit on one side and blue on the other, just like she is on the airplane. Cliff was like, oh, that's great. That's great. So we started to research the actual Memphis Bell nose art because the guy that actually painted her on the airplane back in World War II was one of the crew members. You know, and he was a pretty good artist, but he, you know, he was doing it with a paintbrush on the side of the, the runway, you know. So we went back to the actual picture that he was basing that off of, and it was a George Petty pinup illustration that he did in 1941 for an edition of Esquire magazine. And George Petty was pretty well known. He did this pinup art back in the 40s, and this stuff was pretty risque. I, I didn't realize it. But Cliff went out and he found the actual picture that the Memphis Bell girl was based off. If you've ever looked at the nose art of the Memphis Bell, the girl has one leg tucked under her, and she has her hand up to her ear. And if you see his artwork, she was actually sitting on a stool and talking on the telephone. Of course, that's all removed. So I always thought it was kind of an interesting leg configuration. I didn't understand it until I actually saw the concept of the, the real picture. And so he painted it on the side of the truck. And I wasn't really, you know, I was doing other stuff the day he was doing it. I came walking over there and I'm like, okay, Cliff, it looks awesome. But basically, I said, that's way too racy <laughs> to put that, to leave that like that, because basically George Petty would paint and draw naked women, and he would just cover them with a see-through lingerie. So it was just enough to get past the censors of the day. So I'm sitting here looking at the girl. I mean, you can see her butt crack. You can see nipples. You can see all that stuff. And I'm like, no, no, no. This, this truck's going to be a, a advanced children, all kinds of stuff. I said, you got to tone her down some. So what he did is he outlined her uh, like they did back then with a red outline, and it toned it down. But you can still see, you know, the artwork on the inside. Uh, Cliff just did a fantastic job with 
with shadowing and all kinds of stuff. But even now, it's funny when we do uh, some of the Sergeant Rock T-shirts, where we put that nose art on the back. Some of the some of the wives won't buy the shirt for their husbands, and I'm like, well, that's compared to what you see today. That's really pretty tame, but. You know, they're like, still, I don't want I don't want that woman on the back of my husband's back. <laughs> anyway, Ty, that kind of gives you some of the uh, background of some of the artwork that's on the truck. If you ever get a chance to go to Arlington or one of those cemeteries, I strongly, strongly recommend it. It will give you a real insight to some of the sacrifices that uh, our military has done for us. So anyway, have a good rest of the day. All right, that's it for today. Once again, we're brought to you by Cornwell Tools. Have a great day and get out there and work on something. <laughs>